she was a strong person and very outspoken. She was great. Miss Anna was great. A lot of fun and uh, just a delightful to be around. I'm sure that everybody's told you about all of the beautiful things she's done for our people. Uh, the beauty of her compassion for other people, tremendous mind, just very alert. She was very conscious of human needs. She was really a nice lady. Everybody loved her, I reckon. Annie Early Wheeler may not have been a saint, but it would be hard to convince those who knew her she was anything else. Born in the family summer cabin at Mountain Home in July 1868, she soon learned to ride horseback. In her small riding habit and boots, she felt more at home on her horse memory than anywhere else. Annie rode over the large plantation, not only for pleasure, but was always ready to help those in need. Her deep sense of duty to God, country, and fellow man guided her long and useful life. Despite years of living in Washington and traveling abroad, a large part of Annie's heart was always home at Wheeler in rural Alabama. Annie Wheeler was almost 30 years old when she followed her father and brothers to Cuba. The country was embroiled in the Spanish-American War. Annie served under Clara Barton as a nurse. She put her riding skills to good use, traveling by horseback to care for yellow fever victims. One victim was her own brother, Joe. Her dedicated work in Cuba earned her the title, The Angel of Santiago. In later conflicts, she became known as Miss Sunshine. One of her most treasured possessions was the card she received from a soldier in France. During World War I, the soldier lost both arms. Annie taught him to write by putting a pencil in his bandages. He later wrote by holding the pencil in his teeth. Someone far from harbor you have guided across the bar, he wrote. Congress voted a medal for Miss Annie, but it was never struck. Although her failing eyesight and advancing age kept her from serving in World War II, she saw that hundreds of boxes of garments and other items were shipped overseas from Lawrence County. She was often a comfort to families of soldiers left behind. I had four brothers overseas. I tell you, it was a sad time. We had prayer meetings. We had prayer meeting up at Miss Annie's house. When the Cortland Air Base was established, she helped her friend, Ann Land McWhorter, become hostess at the Basis Service Club. And Miss Annie used to come in and talk to the boys. Before the barracks were built, Annie played host to many of the soldiers. It was not only the boys who came to love Miss Annie. In 1950, a former WAC stationed at Cortland wrote and called her by the familiar term of Aunt Nan. I will never forget you, for to me you will always be the symbol of the South. We walked to your home at the time the wisteria had bloomed along the countryside. And as we approached, the beauty of your plantation seemed almost a dream. Someday, my children will beg me to tell them a story. And when they are old enough to understand, I will tell them the story of Aunt Nan Wheeler. It will be an interesting story, the long walks you took and the time you recited. For your poetry revealed you were and still are perhaps a bit of a dreamer. And yet, with a realist's ambition and convictions to make dreams come true, for yourself and for others. At your age, you possessed an indomitable spirit. I wish to thank you most of all for the gift you have given me, a story of inspiration and hope that is an example of helpful living. Miss Annie was in her 80s during the Korean War, but she visited and spent much time at her little desk. Annie penned letters of encouragement to the bereaved like Frances Wallace, who lost her husband in the conflict. We know not now, but we will know hereafter why our hearts are so torn with grief in our journey across this little speck of stardust that we call the earth. Please don't think of answering my little messages. Bless your precious soldier heart, Annie Wheeler. Mrs. Harriet Montgomery recalls Miss Annie's personality. I say that she was a very strong person. She wasn't a shrinking violet by any means. Miss Annie was strong-willed and a conservationist long before the practice became politically correct. I think a lot of people are aware that the trees along Highway 20, right outside the plantation that's still there, uh, they were going to cut the trees down. And she went to Washington and lobbied, and they put the highway 
divided the highway and it went around the trees. And there's stories that she went out with a shotgun and told them that they could not cut those trees down. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Well, I think that's true. Uh, you know, she was very uh, expressive of her will, and <laughs> if she needed to take a gun with her, she would. She was really a very interesting person. As a child, my first memories, I guess, were the deference to which everyone gave Miss Annie when she walked into a room or when she entered the conversation everyone deferred to her she was a tiny woman but everyone was in awe as though she were a 10 foot tall woman and as a child I really didn't understand why but I knew that that was someone to be reckoned with and uh, you you paid obedience to Miss Annie not just the children everybody was in awe of her much of Miss Annie's life was devoted to helping crippled children. In her will, she left money to the crippled children's hospital. Bill Redding tells us of one instance. We had a boy in our area who had the misfortune of having polio. Miss Annie kindly watched out for these kind of things. The young fellow's name was Walter Lusier, a very good friend of mine, lived on adjoining farms, really. Walter's people were, like many of us people on the farms, they were not uh, financially able to take care of him like they needed he needed to care. Miss Annie moved on the scene and took Walter over and carried him to uh, whatever clinics and I don't know the extent of her traveling with him and carrying him as her own son. Miss Annie had a, a, a capacity of caring for other people that some folks weren't aware of at the time. Um, on a regular basis she visited the local hospitals in the area uh, uh, reading to the children, taking them candy. Um, Miss Annie also, in, in her own way, uh, did a lot for children uh, who needed health care, maybe surgery or corrective surgery, and she provided that or, or arranged it in very anonymously. Miss Annie attended both the white and black churches and schools on the plantation. Land and a contribution of money was given by the Wheeler family for the blacks. Miss Mary Creighton recalls Miss Annie visiting the church. And she would come to church and she would um, make her statement. She would say, every day is sweeter and sweeter. I love to Miss Annie, she didn't make no different in the color, you know. From her parents, she loved everybody. Miss Zeal speaks of the Gothic church. Nom, nom, and we, we, Methodists had church there, and we had church, and it was, we got union literature, you know, and that covered both sides or any kind. It's, it was a dear place to me. I've been going there many years. Mr. Gilbert Harris recalls going to school there. Well, I remember I went to school there at Wheeler Station. They had a, uh, well, they used the church for the school there in Wheeler Station. I went there to school each winter. Of course, back then, you know, they didn't teach school long. I believe about oh, three months the first winter I went there, and then I believe it was five months the second winter that I went to school. That is in 19, 19, 1918 and 1919. Miss Harriet Montgomery tells of Miss Annie's interest in and care of the students. They loved her. They loved her. That's Miss Annie, and that she's our friend. And if we need anything in this school, she'll buy you a box of chalk. She'll get you some scissors and paste if that's what we need. And she'll bring it right back. Oh, they loved her. Miss Byron Collier, in her biographies of representative women in the South, wrote in 1927, It has become a common saying that Miss Annie's automobile can always be recognized at a distance by the little head stuck out on all sides. Going to and returning from Sunday school, her car is a moving mass of juvenile humanity. Much of that juvenile humanity attended classes at Hazelwood High School. Annie Brown Godfrey was a teacher at the school in Town Creek. Uh, Miss Annie Wheeler had done so much for so many of the families that were involved in our school that one year they de uh, dedicated the annual to her. And she was so pleased.
Dr. Curtis Redding of Atlanta remembers Miss Annie's encouragement for young people who visited to better their lives. I lived uh, just below Wheeler here, and I always catch a, would catch a school bus to go to Town Creek to high school. One morning it had snowed, uh, all about three or four inches of snow, and the school bus wasn't running. So I started out walking to Town Creek. And just after I had passed Cortland, uh, Miss Annie came along in uh, her car, and she stopped and picked me up and carried me to, uh, on to school. And she told someone, said anybody that was interested enough to get out and walk to go to school that far on a snowy morning, deserved the best kind of education they could get. When I'd be at my lowest ebb, it would seem that I would get a letter or uh, uh, some encouragement uh, from Miss Annie at that time. And when I did uh, go to dental school, she continued to support me. I had never had a, a real suit of clothes. I, she brought me down and we went up into the attic. Her brother had uh, recently died who uh, and he had all these fine clothes that, uh, that was left there. And uh, he gave me one or two suits of uh, his clothes. I would, I would come to visit uh, Annie when she was having eye troubles as she was getting uh, older, and I would read the Bible to her. Uh, I don't know why, because she could quote the Bible. Yeah, we'd sit up on the porch here in the afternoons, and uh, she would ask me to read a passage out of the Bible, and I would do so. And then she would uh, tell a story or two about West Point, and, or cite a poem. And she would talk about uh, the days when she was a young lady visiting West Point and dating the cadets and meeting them out behind the hedges and that sort of thing. And then. You went to West Point? I did. I went to West Point and uh, finished there, yeah. Annie was very pleased with that because her father and brother had gone to West Point and uh, she, she loved the tradition, so she was glad to see someone from the local community go there. Nell Turner Dirks, whose father came to Wheeler over 60 years ago, recalls her first memories of Miss Annie. Miss Annie and her brother, Colonel Joe, used to have an Easter egg hunt for all the children in the neighborhood. We they hid the eggs in the boxwood in the flower gardens. And they had these eggs, and when you found one, you opened it up, and there were treasures, probably candy, and maybe some little prizes. I don't remember. But I do remember that I found two very similar to this that were a little bit larger. So I just really felt that I had uh, done something wonderful find two of the big colorful eggs. We had a wonderful time and of course the boxwood was so much fun to play around for, for little ones. Uh, we could hide and play hide and seek a lot out there. And Christmas was a special time around the plantation for all. And every Christmas, why, everybody around on the Wheeler Plantation came in, and she gave everybody a gift. Now, uh, some, sometimes, you know, for children, they'd give them socks, or she'd give them gloves. And, and uh, for the ladies, she'd give them some kind of a little gift that they could keep. I brought a vase that she gave my mother. Some of them would make remarks about getting same thing every year or something new. and uh, she she quit giving gifts but she didn't quit giving uh, the fruit she would always go around and set a box of fruit on the porch children were not the only ones who enjoyed Miss Annie's kindness Miss Velma Coffee remembers we were just ke ke teenage kids you know we stayed up here half the time because we had a big tennis court out there in front of the gate that big old tree right over there you see that big old tree uh, over there, and there was a swing in that, and we would be we would be crazy. We we, we girls would sit in the, the the swing, and the boys would pump us, and they'd put us in the, up in them trees so far you would just scare us to death. No one can say exactly when Miss Annie began planting boxwood about the place and developing her flower gardens. But by the mid-30s, she was able to ship a carload of boxwood from Wheeler to her sister Carrie in Virginia. 
what they oh are. yes and and somebody and I don't know who that was now but it, she told us then had given her a new sundial and she was so proud of it that she carried us to see the sundial and told us exactly how it worked and what time it was and oh yeah a lot of difference oh there were flower gardens all over the place and there was one out out there and she kept it kept it real clean and had all kinds of flowers in it and Doc Turner and James Sims were to be married under the Wisteria Arbor, but rain forced the wedding inside. The couple exchanged vows in the house with Miss Annie's and her grandmother, Miss Turner's blessing. Miss Annie was always a lady, and she had definite ideas as to what constituted such. Oh, I did her nails, and she saw that I was wearing nail polish. That's the first time she told me I was not a lady. No lady would wear nail polish. Somewhat eccentric in that uh, she didn't like a lot of makeup and fingernail polish. And if uh, if you had a lot of makeup on or if you had fingernail polish, she'd ask you if you had something wrong with you or if you'd hurt your hands. You must not sit with your back against the back of a chair. Ladies don't do that. You must not cross your knees. You must cross your ankles. She gave me all the pointers anybody could ever need as to how to be a lady, and it didn't do a bit of good. Being a lady meant wearing proper clothes. When she was at Wheeler, she wore dresses that were made for her by Miss Zills. And also, there was a handkerchief in the pocket. She always had a handkerchief. She was also concerned that her father be remembered properly. You would know uh, that uh, uh, one of the historians uh, borrowed all of her papers and wrote the history uh, of, uh, his, of her father and because he criticized him for having taken uh, having two jobs for the federal government which was strictly against the rules uh, but he got by with it because he was so famous as a general in the Civil War and that he'd serve as a general in the Spanish-American War they were perfectly willing for him to be a member of Congress and also to serve as a general but Miss Annie said, nobody will ever use my papers again to deface my father. <laughs> she was going to defend him to the last. Well, Miss Annie was a, a nice, cute, sort of feisty little lady. She was driving sort of a beat up. It wasn't an old car, Chevrolet car, but it was pretty beat up and it looked old. And she took out across the fields and the ditches and the rocks. She, nothing got in her way. She just drove over everything. <laughs> Took us where she wanted us to see and uh, brought us back the same way. It was not the most comfortable ride I've ever had. She decided she would do the driving, that that would be easier than telling you know, us where to go. And we'd be approaching an intersection or something, and cars would be coming from every direction. But by the time Miss Annie got there, they'd cleared out just like they knew it was coming. <laughs> what stuck out in my mind more than anything else as a small child was remembering Miss Annie slide down the banister at her birthday party. That's how she greeted the guests that day. She slid down the banister. That was the last birthday party right before she passed away. The railroad was the connecting link for the Wheeler family to the outer world. If she wanted to get on the train, if it was not regularly stopping, she'd just call Sheffield and, and stop it. they'd stop. Do you know, they, they ran a little streamliner through once called the General Joe Wheeler. Do you remember that little train on, the, on the Southern it. Railroad? Somebody remember that thing came through and she was on it and was down, stopped out at Chase. We got a little big bulky roads of Miss Anna Wheeler. I'd forgotten about that, but there she was with all her glory back in the back of that little train. In April 1955, Miss Annie made her last trip home. She died in Richmond on April 10, 1955, after a fall which broke her hip. I came back on the train with Miss Julia and Lucy, and I think it was at Knoxville that a cousin of theirs got on the train and came the rest of the way with us. General Betts, wasn't mm -hmm. it? 
and she was buried in one of the dresses that I made her. It had a little white piping, you know, around the neck of it. She looked so pretty. We accompanied the funeral as it went from this house where we're sitting out to the cemetery, which is out in the back where she was laid to rest. And as we uh, neared the cemetery, one of the most beautiful sights and scenes and, and melody I've ever heard the black people of the plantations had gathered in and were in seclusion behind the cemetery and they broke into singing Swing Low Sweet Chariot coming for to carry me home. The beauty and the blessings that flowed to many of our lives through Miss Annie's life in so many different ways we could never forget.